Welcome to the Stoa. The Stoa is a digital campfire where we cohere and dialogue about what matters most at the knife's edge of what's happening now. Okay, chickens. Uh, feel calm, uh, grounded, and ready. So, welcome to the Stoa. I am the steward of the Stoa, Peter Lindbergh, and the Stoa is a place for us to cohere and dialogue about what matters most at the knife's edge of this moment. And today we have uh, my buddy David Fuller, everyone's favorite holy journalist from Rebel Wisdom, um, and. Uh, David and I had a conversation about uh, kind of conspiracy theories, being a journalist in this culture war, liminal war space. And this is an ongoing conversation that him and I have been having for a while now. And we did this uh, kind of spontaneous jam session last week, uh, got some good feedback on the Rebel Wisdom channel. And the idea today was to have sort of a continuation of that conversation, not just with him and I, but with the other people. Uh, the people at the Stoa, uh, the tribe at the Stoa that's forming. So what's going to happen today uh, is uh, me and David are going to have a little exchange. And uh, if you have questions that come alive for you, write them in the chat box. And um, when uh, we pivot to the Q&A portion, I will take you in and then you can kind of read your question uh, to David and we can have a kind of a conversation with the collective intelligence that emerges. So that being said, uh, David, how are you doing today? Uh, good. Yeah. Yeah, I'm good. It's good. Um, so I was thinking, because not everyone uh, might have watched the video uh, where we had that kind of conversation, uh, but, but the general theme is kind of the complexities about doing journalism in this liminal state or this liminal war. Um, and I, I wonder if you can kind of share your thoughts on that in, in a broad, broad way. Hmm. I guess it's... I mean, journalism is a kind of loaded term. I think I prefer framing it as like, how do we find truth? And that sort of problem of finding truth feels very pressing at the moment in the kind of overload of information. And I sketched out kind of in our conversation and also in the conversation or in the, the films that I've done recently about um, I looked specifically at one story of London Real and David Icke and that that film being banned by YouTube and all of the issues around that 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 brought up like huge issues um, and I sense that like the kind of the meta framing for me feels like we're in this interregnum space I think um, Zach Stein has called it the world what's this the world between worlds um, education in a time between worlds. I think that was his book. So this sort of time between worlds where you can kind of imagine and my background, I'm a, I, I worked for Channel 4 News and the BBC and I've made documentaries for, for both of them. So I've been in kind of newsrooms and part of the, the kind of traditional media machine for almost two decades and then created Rebel Wisdom initially with a couple of films with Jordan Peterson, and then uh, a kind of exploration into a lot of the same areas that um, I know, Peter, you've covered on the Intellectual Explorers podcast. And so just following the thread of what is this emergent conversation. And so kind of being very aware of both the, like the, the benefits of the alternative media, like covering stories that I wasn't easily able to cover in the mainstream and being sort of free to put out everything that I wanted and not having a whole load of editors that I had to kind of keep happy and all of those kind of really beneficial sides of being outside the machine. But then at the same time, feeling that we are and then using kind of Jordan Hall's model of kind of the blue church, the sort of blue church enterprise, which was very broadcast, very, a lot of our way of understanding the world in up until quite recently was that we, we put a lot of the, um, our sense making capacity onto that structure, whether we realized it or not onto academia, onto the mainstream media, onto this very broadcast way of making sense of the world. And 
the the and now we're in this very sort of decentralized much more uh, decentralized modality this much more digital modality that has undermined a lot of that blue church structure and for good reasons a lot of that structure had become quite hollow quite corrupt and a lot of it was a kind of um like the kathy newman jordan peterson interview i think is a really good example of that it's like a performative rather than actually trying to get to truth it became like a performative impression of truth seeking and i think a lot of journalism had got that way so i think like i'm not i'm trying to hold this place of not trying to defend the old structure because people especially on youtube a very anti-mainstream it leans very anti-mainstream so it's trying but it's trying to hold some of the values of that structure which at its best had fact checking had some principles of trying to get both sides of the story before publishing something which had kind of an evolved set of practices that i don't see happening at all in the in the alternative media and that really if we're in this kind of interregnum between the decline of that old truth seeking mechanism with all of its faults, we're not, we don't have, and you can kind of imagine there might be a place on the other side of that where we have some kind of decentralized, reliable, democratic way of finding truth. We're not there yet. And I don't really know what that might look like. It seems that we're in this kind of very, um, we're in the valley between two potential kind of solutions to the problem of truth. And we can't avoid we none of us have the capacity to find out absolutely everything for ourselves no matter how much we like to kind of think that we do we don't we we always proxy our sense making to someone or something to some degree and realizing that we're doing that how do we how do we find the signal from the noise in this heavily kind of weaponized and information saturated and um complex environment and, and i kind of i don't know how many people here perhaps how many people here have seen the war on sense making the film with daniel schmachtenberger great there's a quite a, a a lot of people i think he lays it out like lays out the territory about as well as anyone i've i've seen and so that's what i'm trying that's the inquiry and i think as we discussed in our film the other day peter i anyone who's coming at this with an air of certainty that they think they know what the answer is whether that's um kind of free speech absolutism or like any ideological perspective is not equipped i think we could drill down into that like for me free speech absolutism doesn't work it's not sustainable in a world of finite attention there has like i believe there has to be some kind of curation which i know gets a lot of people don't like to hear on youtube especially like I don't think the, the marketplace of the marketplace of ideas right now is not functioning well for many different reasons. Um, there's a whole load of branching off points we can go into on there. So yeah, yeah. Uh, so something that's alive right now is um, Stephen Luke's uh, three faces of power is coming to mind, and how he understands power is that there's like decision making power that's the lowest level, then there's non decision making power, then there's ideological power. So another way to look at it is like decision-making power is just like the content, the propositions being exchanged, like the obvious stuff. Uh, and then non-decision-making power is the agenda. Whoever gets to set the agenda gets to influence the decisions, gets to influence the propositions. And then you can look at the, the second one as the frame, kind of like the uh, unconscious frame that, that a conversation is agreeing to. Uh, and then the last one is ideology, obviously, like who controls the ideology. And I think that Kathy, Kathy Newman interview with Peterson was like a brilliant display of how those three things got exposed. Um, Cause you know, Kathy Newman thought like, Oh, this guy's going to buy into my agenda, buy into my frame. He's like, uh, uh, that's not going to happen. And he just sort of like called it out in a way uh, without calling it out. So, and then I think I just wanted to like, uh, I have a follow up question with that, but with the blue church in the, the machine, what do you think those things are? That agenda, that frame, and the ideology that's currently influencing it. Um, and let's let's sort of put a flag in the fact that even the, the the blue church frame is a is a useful approximation. It's not. I think any of these right. ways that we can talk about this, they're useful up to a point, but they're also obscure 
some stuff as well. I think like the blue church, I find a really useful frame to, to use, but I also, um, I think I, I've, I've also kind of become really aware of the limitations of seeing it in that way as well, because I feel, I feel it can be too optimistic about, oh, well, the blue church is collapsing and we'll just transition to something new. I think, I think that's kind of naive. Um, and I, I, I think if you really kind of think about what that means, it's a pretty terrifying prospect. Um, but I mean, for me, the frame, like the interesting thing for me, the, the focus about rebel wisdom from the beginning was the frame that I was most aware of was the, the limiting kind of materialistic secular frame that I was really familiar with from the, from kind of working in traditional media. And that's why I was so initially taken with Jordan Peterson was because this was a guy who was challenging the new atheists on their own turf. And he wasn't easily dismissed as being pseudoscientific or as being new agey or being any of any of the ways that normally that frame is defended. And I knew how like that kind of Richard Dawkins, Sam Harris frame was extremely powerful in the media. And as someone who's kind of been interested in spirituality and been interested in transformation and all of these subjects and just really aware that that's just not part of the mainstream conversation i was kind of very aware of where that's defended and trying to do stories about stuff that i could see where the cracks in that worldview were were kind of being shown up like psychedelic therapies for example was something i i, I covered from about 2008 onwards so i've i've always been really interested in like okay what are, what are those frames and how is that truth how are those um perspectives defended and perspectives held so that's something that i've been aware and interested in from well before rebel wisdom right and it's like what we said in our last chat is that each mimetic tribe has their own cancel culture uh and you can also say they each have their own overton window uh in a sense mm. uh things that you should talk about or should not talk about um but here here's that me at the edge of my thinking i'm curious what you, you have to say about this uh, going to that, back to the uh, Luke's uh, three phases of power, let's just say you have the, the content, the propositions, the agenda, the frame, and then you got the ideology. Uh, and it seems like in our sense-making space, in order to do good journalism, we cannot be unconscious of any of those layers. We have to have our eyes on each one of them and being able to talk about them and level set with them. Um, would you agree with that? Yes. Yeah, I think, I think that, yeah, we have to be constantly aware of what the framing is that we're bringing to something because you can't operate, you can't operate completely without being in some kind of a frame. So you think you have to be aware of when you're slipping between them. Um, Jamie Wheel had a really beautiful analogy of like the phone and the different apps on the phone. So you're using different apps for different purposes, but then to try and be clear about what app you're using at what, ta at what time and then if you can kind of be aware that you're doing that. Right. And I think like what's really helpful in getting that muscle, that skill set of like being able to spot the agenda and call it out is what you and I've been playing with with all these different conversational modalities, whether it's circling mm -hmm. or we spacing, because you, you go into this sort of artificial container, this modality, and the rules are explicit and you have to be cognizant of not only your own intention, but of other people's intention. And then you get to play in that space. Um, and then I think if you, you, if you play in enough of these spaces, then you can kind of see in the wild, the interpersonal wild, like, oh shit, what game are we playing here? And it's usually the game that kind of like instrumentalizes the relationship towards something. Yeah. Yeah. And there are strong forces within culture and society that are saying, if you're not playing that game, then you're the sucker. Like that's the right. whole, that's the whole vibe of, of business is this enforcement of a kind of frame that if you're not playing that game, you're, you're naive or you're an idiot or similar. Right. And uh, so I'm going to turn it to the, the, the Q and A in a moment, but uh, going back to that, that framework, cause I'm I find it quite useful right now. The, the top layer, the ideology layer, which is something that I talked about the uh, culture war is like, even though I don't think every mimetic tribe has equal truth claims or values, I, I do think it's helpful to act as if they are just to be a performative agnostic in order to speak to, uh, to each one of them. Um, 
and so what is your like thoughts on when no one is certain about what's the right ideology or what's the right final philosophy, how do we negotiate like the, the mimetic mediation thing? How do you think rebel wisdom or journalists, how do you think we can negotiate with all these different ideologies at play? Or maybe negotiation is the wrong word. Like how do you, how do you hunt for the truth in a way when like, you know, there's so many different ideologies that are going to interpret it in, in their own way. Um, I don't know. I don't know. I think it's probably a methodology thing as much as it is anything else. Like there are some questions, like there's a, take an example. I mean, there's some truth claims going around at the moment um, that I don't feel equipped to do an interview around. Like some of these alternative medical uh, frames around but like, I get that in the comments a lot. Like, well, why don't you interview Judy Mikovits? Why don't you interview this person or that person? It's like, because honestly, I don't feel equipped to do that. I don't, I don't know. And I don't think that even spending half a day researching her and researching her claims, I could then do a, a, a good job. I mean, I might, I might be able to do a better job than most of the interviews that I've seen so far with that's my other, my other concern. If we're talking about specific examples, that's I've, I've had a bit of a kickback even today of, of calling these, some of these people fringe medical figures, um, that that's Russell conjugation. That's me kind of dismissing them. My concern isn't, and I, I actually put that into the last film. I, I actually tried very hard to show, look that there, there was another doctor in, so there's these, these people who are being interviewed on London Real, for example, um, Judy Mikovits being one, Rashid Buttar, Shiva Ayadurai, who without evaluating, and I'm trying to talk about it on the channel without really evaluating their truth claims, and people just get so triggered by you talking about them at all without going into the content. And I'm trying very hard to say, let's not go into the content. I don't feel equipped to do that. Let's look at it as a phenomenon, whether it no matter what you think about their, their claims, they are getting a huge amount of traction right now. It is a phenomenon that they are becoming hugely popular. And my concern with them, as an example, is that they seem to me to be only being interviewed uh, on very sympathetic, by very sympathetic people, because they're basically, the mainstream is saying, no, you're anti-vax, we're not gonna talk to you. But there's all of these places that are hungry for views, that are interviewing them in a very um, sympathetic way. And so their ideas are not being challenged and there is no, like, and I, and I tried very hard in that to say, look, there's another guy in New York who put out a video and said, hey, something's going on. Um, what I'm seeing doesn't look like pneumonia, it looks like altitude sickness. And then a couple of weeks afterwards, what he was observing is now part of the understanding of what's going on with COVID. So it's like, I was trying to say, look, you can't shut down. You can't just shut out someone who at the moment has, a, has by definition, a fringe or a, a minority view. Like these are, these are important voices and actually they're important things that then get put into the, into the conversation. But at the same time, my concern is that free speech without the the ideas being challenged in the marketplace of accountability is not free speech it's something else it's like pro it's propaganda and it's not being challenged so that's part of this kind of interregnum where we used to have a structure that kind of worked we'd have figures who would go onto channels they would say what they said they'd be challenged by journalists probably health journalists who knew the the area pretty well They'd then go on to other, other channels and people would watch the previous interviews. They'd ask them questions based on that. You'd have this sifting of, of expertise and of good answers and, and you'd have this process. Right now, it feels like we've got these self-enclosed ecosystems. And again, I'm trying to talk about this in a way that is not dismissing. And as soon as you use the word conspiracy theory or alternative viewpoint or anything, people get like really, oh, why aren't you interviewing Judy Mikovits? Why aren't you doing this? Arr! It's like, I'm trying to look at it as a phenomenon without judging or, or assessing the, the, the value of the truth claims. Like I'm trying to hold that space of saying, I'm seeing a phenomenon that worries me because on one side, you've got the traditional media or the mainstream that's not taking these things seriously and thinking 
they can do what they've always done, which is like gatekeep everyone they don't like out of the conversation. And I don't think that's going to work anymore. I think that's an old modality. I think I even said in the piece that I put out, look, David Icke, he's been saying the same thing that he's been saying for 30 years, talking about this global fascist state. I don't think, and I, I, I have some respect for him for that. He didn't, like for me, someone like Alex Jones shifts and just, he finds what's, what, what goes well, it's conspiracy as entertainment, he moves, he shifts, he doesn't really believe a lot of the stuff he's saying. David Icke does believe a lot of the stuff he's saying. And I think, fair play to him, 30 years of talking about lizard people and stuff that if he'd, if he'd only changed that, he could have been way more popular. If he'd gone down the kind of anti-globalist route that, um, that uh, Jones went down, I think he'd have been more popular. But he was saying stuff that makes a load of people think, man, you're, you're way too far out for, for me. You say some good stuff, but you also come in with the 12-foot lizards and the, the, the British royal family being cannibals and all that sort of stuff, and it's a little bit too much. Fair play to him. He stayed true to his guns. And I think, so I think on one side, you've got the mainstream thinking they can still gatekeep out all of the alternative voices, and that will make a difference, and it won't. So I think lots more people have to be part of the conversation. And that means platforming in their language, people who they would have always said we shouldn't platform in the past. So that's on one side. And then you've got on the other side, this kind of uncanny valley of these, these people not being, these truth claims are not being subject to scrutiny. And so you've got these kind of little ecosystems. And I'm trying to talk about this in a way of like, look, this is what I'm seeing. And I'm trying to hold this meta perspective. And it's really, really difficult with conspiracy theory in particular, because people just lose their fucking shit. They absolutely lose their fucking shit in the comments, especially. And they're like, why aren't you talking about Bill Gates? Why aren't you investigating the plot to cull most of humanity? Why aren't you? It's like, that's, that's what I'm wrestling with right now is the impossibility of trying to hold a meta frame when people are so religiously triggered by the subject and are so obsessed with this is the most important thing and that's what i'm really wrestling with is just in maybe i should ignore the comments but i'm also um i want to kind of be open to to criticism and open to self-reflection but at the same time it's like this and conspiracy theory is the thing that's kind of overwhelmingly like this is the central story as far as i can tell as a journalist right now that is of interest and needs to be needs to be addressed but i feel so incredibly exposed and um yeah i feel it's such a difficult one to talk about um because yeah just just it's it's almost impossible because people just immediately degenerate down to your controlled opposition you don't know what you're talking about you haven't looked at this piece you haven't looked at that piece so trying to talk about it from a meta frame is, is, is difficult. And I'll also say, yeah, it, I'm getting kind of a little bit activated around it. Just, just pe <laughs> because people say, oh, you're controlled opposition, you're scared of this. It's like, do you really not think that putting stuff out in this area is not like difficult enough? Do you not think that, um, yeah, it's like, that 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 annoys me is like this this constant like oh you're just a mainstream shill because you're not calling out bill gates like look fucking loads of youtube channels calling out bill gates stop trying to make my youtube channel into every other fucking conspiracy youtube channel fuck off go somewhere else i'm putting this stuff out for free sorry <laughs> so, so if you so if you ever want to trigger david fuller just call him controlled opposition <laughs> get a nice little rant. right i'm out yeah um so uh I do have another question that's, that's alive, and then we'll, we'll jump into uh, a Q&A. Uh, so my read is that, I, I like what you said about the blue church, because that can like quickly become like a mongrel concept, you know, like a very uh, crude concept. And my sense of how you relate to sort of like the, the phenomenon of it is that I think you would acknowledge that the institutions that we're referring to as the blue church have been corrupted. Uh, but mm. the procedures and like their, their methodology should not be thrown out. We should kind of take the best of that and repurpose it into this sort of decentralized uh, environment. Um, yeah. And so, and I, I sent you this message on WhatsApp. This is like a 10 minute message and, and I don't think I got a proper response for it. So I'm going to ask it again. And then I think it relates to, to uh, what we're talking about here is it's like the one man army thing, right? You're like a, a 
fucking talented journalist. You, uh, you know, you've done all this emotional work. You have a great platform. It's a gold standard, the sense making web, in my opinion, and a lot of people's opinions as well. But it's almost like a one man army. You know, it's like it's David Fuller. Uh, and then you can get squashed like a bug uh, with all these kind of like this conspiracy thought forces, parapolitical stuff, you know, the blue church stuff. What a creating a, a sense making journalist army, you know, like let's, let's like, let's release this, this you multiply you and all of us become like sense making journalists in this space. Um, so I just wanted like what you think about that, what the room thinks about that. And if, if, how do we go about it? I'd love to know how to, yeah, I'm not very good at, um, that, <laughs> whatever the word is. Um, like when I left Channel 4 News, they make, a, they make a video for you when you leave Channel 4 News. It's sort of like a tribute. And, um, and the, th the whole theme of this 15-minute film was, fuck it, I'll do it myself. Okay. With everyone in the newsroom going, fuck it, I'll do it myself. So, I mean, Rebelwism is not just a one-man army. Alexander uh, Bino, I think, has been on here as well, is, is my co-founder. Um, but in terms of the media side, that's basically me. I, I shoot, I edit, I produce, I report, I do everything myself. So that, and, and I guess the reason that I do that, like the reason I've gained all of those skills over the last 20 years is because I, I'm pretty impatient. I'm pretty um, single-minded and I'm pretty, um, yeah, I'm pretty impatient actually. I think that's the, the main thing. Um, and probably don't work well with others. <laughs> that's angry and impatient, uh, Fuller. <laughs> angry and impatient. No, I, that's my air for sure, Peter. I mean, you've tapped on something like that. My area for growth is how do I scale what Rebel Wisdom is doing? And I don't know the answer to that. I don't know. Um, I don't know what that would look like, to be honest. But I do think that's necessary. I mean, we've talked about, like, I, I'm also fairly grandiose. I do think there's a space in the media landscape for a kind of vice with heart like mm. vice is kind of collapsing under the weight of internal corruption too much kind of ideological capture all these sort of things like there is a space for treating these kind of topics of sort of transformational spiritual like i can feel the outlines of that space and i think that we've got as good a chance of getting in there as anyone right, right. but i don't know how to how to how to do it, go about it. Yeah. And uh, just for people who are listening, I'm a, I'm a Toronto correspondent for Rebel Wisdom. And so there's like a personal interest to me, like I don't have your talent stack in the journalistic sense, but you know, there's an eagerness there um, to, to engage in that and then sort of maybe weaponize probably the wrong word, but to kind of activate people who are inspired to do it as well. But the question is how to do it. So if anyone has any thoughts, you know, we're, we're curious to hear, but let's turn to the, some questions. Um, Tyson, if you can unmute yourself and ask uh, David your question. Sure, thank you. Um, let's see. Thank you, David, for being here and like taking on more than your load. Like, I really appreciate you for the work that you're doing, and it's been just very influential and important for me uh, lately. And my question here is like, so with the whole Judy Mikovits thing. I myself have found myself like yearning for like someone that doesn't agree with her and isn't so sympathetic, please like interview her. Where can I get this? And I can say the same for a number of figures. And so you said something like um, you might not, you don't feel equipped or prepared or something like that to do that interview. And so I just, and, and I even found myself, like I even tweeted Eric Weinstein and I asked him like if you would interview her because I have this sense, like I, I just want, and it's not because I need to, because I agree with her, or I disagree with her. It's because I want better examples of like how this should be done. Um, and I've, and I've been following Brian Rose for years and used to really like not, yeah. And I had a lot of respect for him and his work. So it's just, I really want stronger examples of how this should be done. And so I guess now my question was whether or not we need new platforms or if we need some sort of way of organizing to influence these platforms. And then, so what would maybe um, help you feel comfortable doing some of these interviews that are at the edge or that, that sort of um, risk all of that, all of that pushback. Um, and so, yeah, whether that is like a platform where there's like inherent agreements 
and understanding amongst the viewers of the the spirit of where the the inquiries are coming from um yeah i'm just curious if that comes up if it, what comes up for you there like do we need a whole new container and a whole new environment and platforms or is there something that would make you feel more comfortable taking on some of those conversations well i think just thinking about that as an example say judy mikovitz i think i mean there are some things that i would feel confident asking her which would be some of the discrepancies in the account or in the sort of pandemic film compared to what's publicly available in terms of her arrest and stuff like that. I mean, that's fairly obvious. What I'd be also wary, I think the way to do it, I'm kind of thinking as I'm, as you were talking, would be to try and find someone who was equipped to do that and to actually be the person to hold that conversation. So actually have a three-way conversation with someone who was, who was, uh, medically trained would be able to go in because I would be wary about I, I, I'm, I'm wary, wary of the optics of being in that position of because I just the other thing is people don't get online what what healthy com, what healthy challenge looks like and they basically assume that you are like I had that with Eric Weinstein when I when I did the interview about Epstein and the disc and I and I wanted to put myself in the position of challenging him because I was aware of what we were going into was kind of controversial and also I don't necessarily agree with everything that he's saying about the kind of the degeneration of the media I, I and I'm genuinely puzzled by why they haven't like i don't understand for example why panorama the bbc documentary isn't doing something about epstein i would be astonished if they weren't given the uh, given i know lots of the people who work on that program and i know how it's a it's a big story with big uk connections i mean newsnight did the interview with prince andrew and they were chasing that for months uh, asking buckingham palace like time and time again to have the interview so the idea that so I, I wanted to hold that place of like pushing back a little bit on Eric. And then you see in the comments, people like, oh, look at this shill mainstream journalist. Like, like people don't understand what, like that we've lost this kind of ability to differentiate between the person and the job. And the whole point of journalism when it's practiced correctly is that it's a set of, it's a set of, in the same way that being a lawyer, like, being a lawyer involves doing a professional job. It doesn't mean you have to believe the person you're representing or believe that the person that you're opposing needs to be convicted. It's like you've got a job to do and you've got a job to do within this. And I don't think, especially online, people just don't understand. So if I put myself in the position of interviewing Judy Mikovits and did did a proper job, the optics of that, I think, would would just lead to me being... And it doesn't really matter what I've done previously. Like I think in some ways I've built up a track record in some interviews of taking different perspectives, but that doesn't matter because most people will only see me in that one interview and will just go, oh, look at that fucking BBC journalist, shill, asshole attacking Judy Mikovits. And, and that I think, so I think we've lost that ability. I think we've lost that ability, especially on YouTube where we've got a comments thread of differentiating between the job and the person. And so those things are just, they're stuck together now and I don't think we'll be able to kind of pull them apart again. So I think the only way to do it would be to get on someone to hold the other pole. And then you've got to think about who that might be and then manage that conversation and, and probably step into that role of um, trying to be a kind of neutral observer. And that's a really, that's a really tricky, role to fill and i don't quite know and th then you've got the paradox and I, i'm wrestling with this all the time it's like i do have opinions and i do i feel more and more tempted to actually bring my opinions out and kind of to to play more of a of a role but i also feel that what we're really looking for is 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 someone or something to play a kind of trusted mediation role and I don't know, I don't know how to resolve that because the more I put my own opinions out there, especially about some of these controversial topics, the less I'll be 
seen as someone who can actually kind of hold a neutral space in in yeah mediating it right that's interesting because uh, the terms that uh, connor barnes and i did in that cultural paper it was uh, dirty bias or clean bias and it's like if 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 like clean bias is just admitting your bias and then trying to be search for the truth but if you don't do that there's this like sense of inauthenticity about this performative neutrality and you have like a dirty bias feeling associated with that so it is a very very challenging hmm. thing to, to engage with i don't think anyone's really got it right yet except maybe you're the, the closest one well i don't know i'm, I'm starting to i think everyone's going to lose their shit with the next film i put out let's put it that way oh nice well we, we just want to see angry fuller just just be angry in the film then, then, then. i actually i just thought that i might do that i mean that's one other <laughs> I might just put out something where I just rant and just say, look, fucking sort it out. Stop <laughs> asking that in the comments. And if you're not up to it, then find another channel because I want more from you guys than this. This is just not good enough. Nice. We got some yeses in the chat, some shaking heads. So uh, the store approves. Let's just put it that way. Um, so we have uh, Sean I'm mad as hell and I'm not taking it anymore. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Jeff. <laughs> there we go. Perfect. I think, I mean, honestly, I... I'm, I'm, I'm seriously thinking about that because otherwise it's going to come out kind of subconsciously anyway. It's like, right. guys, shape up. Stop reading the comments. Kind of. I, I am trying not to take it as seriously. Um, and Joe Rogan does say, don't look at the comments. But at the same time, the whole project is framed around being open to feedback and being, I, I don't know how to do that. I don't know how to... Because the comments thread is just not conducive to like genuine dialogue or genuine feedback. And when you see a good comment where someone's actually taken some time to put something together, you're like, oh, that's unusual. Right. Um, but then people get very upset if you delete them. I mean, I do delete some comments if it's just like not, if it's just completely reactive and not taking any, taking us forward, then I, I, I'll I, admit I, I have deleted U YouTube comments. Um, but yeah, I don't know where the right place to sort of in, engage in those dialogues is because I don't that's, argue on Facebook much anymore. That's because uh, um, at the store, we or I disable all YouTube comments, even though we post these because I, I just like I think about you because I was featured on the channel three times. And then it's like you gravitate towards like the like the stupidest comments, like who's this pretentious guy? What the fuck? And then you just like you, you go into it and I'm like, man, it must be exhausting to be full of just like pruning this shit all the time. Um, so I'm my hat off to you for <laughs> engaging that struggle. Okay. So Sean Williams, uh, if you can unmute yourself and ask your question to Fuller. Great. Uh, thanks David. I think, um, this question is hard to answer to ask and even harder to answer. Um, you mentioned something about free speech, absolute, uh, absolutism sort of being opposed to, um, curation. Um, when I think of curation, I think of one person using kind of their unified sense to sort of decide like what is worth sharing. Do you see something in between, and free speech at absolute and sort of being on the opposite side of that, where you're just using like multiple people's senses and allowing them to sort of do their own thing. Is there some way to sort of synthesize these things to have some kind of, um, what would you say, like a distributed creation type thing? It, or is that I think of Daniel Schmachtenberger saying something like, um, that systems are po impossible to retrofit if they're built on the wrong axioms. That's sort of like a more, uh, that kind of fills me with despair to think of it in that way. Or is it more like, well, the transition is possible because it's necessary. Like, do you see some kind of like synthesis between these two things to provide some kind of distributed creation? hard to ask and answer. Um, I don't know. I don't know. I, I don't know what it would look like. I'm, I've seen so many, I've seen the failure conditions of like the main, of the, the alternative media. And a lot of it is, is driven by like audience capture but how do you avoid audience capture when you've got in these feedback loops and how do you, do you not get caught in, in that? Um, I, I don't know what the answer to cur curation is. I mean, 
it's certainly a much more important factor than I think a lot of people realize. Um, yeah, I, do, I don't know. I, I mean, I talk, spoke to Douglas Murray the other day and he, he actually said it in the previous one. It's like, we, we can't imagine, especially in the, in the US, we can't imagine what that would look like. Like who, who would you give that power to? Like if you're gonna say at some point, someone has to make that decision and I think, I think most of us recognize that there are, there are some examples, whether that's child pornography or whether that's um, far right recruiting or whether that's incitement to um, violence, that there have to be some, some restrictions, like there can't be a complete free for all. So at some point you, unless you are a complete absolutist, which I mean, I think most people on YouTube, especially, are kind of naive absolutists because they haven't really thought it through. They're just like, ah, oh, you can't delete my comment. I can say whatever I want. And it comes right. from that kind of instinctive place of I'll do whatever the fuck I want where, where I want, which um, I, I don't agree with that. I mean, I, I do, like, I, I, I don't think I am... Um, obliged to have anyone post on my Facebook wall. I don't think I'm obliged to to put up with that if I don't want someone to post on my Facebook wall. I, I think I'm within my rights to say, no, I'm not having that here. So I think the same thing is true of, of the Rebel Wisdom YouTube channel. I, I'd, I'd like to find a solution to the problem of a quality discussion in the comments. And I've got no fucking idea what that's going to look like because it doesn't seem designed for that positive. I mean, it could, I could imagine it becoming a, a, a self-regulating system. I think there is something about what are the conditions for creating a self-regulating system that is um, solid and that is organic and that becomes self-policing. And I don't know, and I don't, I think that's probably less, I think a healthy ecosystem will do most of the work for us. But what does that look like and how do you create it right. and and how do you create a healthy community um which is again something that douglas murray said in the interview yesterday which is actually a lot of the question of um free speech and voices that are like misinformation and all these sort of things are a, a, they're a question of societal health more than they are of a question of do you ban this person or do you censor this person? Because in a healthy society, someone pushing a miracle cure or someone, or like David Icke is not going to, like David Icke would not be getting the traction he's got right now if it wasn't for the fact that we're all freaked out and the fact that he speaks with such authority. And, um, and I'm not saying that David Icke has no signal. I think the important thing, like whenever you talk about these is that David Icke clearly has some signal. I think he's actually... There's, there's some sort of metaphorical truth in a lot of what he's saying, even if I don't think there's a lot of factual truth. Um, but that's the other problem. This is a slightly different issue, but it's like, it's impossible to talk about any of these things without layering in kind of like context upon context and condition upon condition. And then when I'm putting a video together, it just becomes unwieldy because I can't put enough context to, to, to avoid all of the potential objections and people saying, oh, well, you're not including this or you're not including that. So it's, um, yeah, but going back to your main point, I think it's a, I think, and as you can tell, maybe I'm kind of thinking about this in real time as I'm answering you and kind of maybe coming to more of, I think it's a case of, I think it's a case of the health of the ecosystem rather than it is a set of principles. And it's like, how do we create healthy ecosystems? That's the, the question, I think. Fertile soil, yeah. Cool. Uh, Jordan, you had a question. Hey, David. Um, am I on? All right, okay. So I am curious about you saying that you're, you're very terrified of this idea of the, the post-blue church when the collapse finally comes. And I'm wondering if you'd comment on exactly why that is so scary. I think if you're not scared by that prospect, you haven't really understood what it means. Like just take, just take, so the blue church is 
pretty much everything. I mean, if you if you look at it quite narrowly, as like, and I think a lot of people who are kind of clapping on the end of the blue church are looking at it quite narrowly as sort of liberal Hollywood and the New York Times and all of those kind of uh, institutions that I think a lot of us think have become at least partial or not not helpful. Um, but if you realize that like the blue church is the entire actuation capacity of the entire world that was built up after the second world war, like it was all of these systems, all of these structures based on, we had this huge clash of different worldviews that culminate in the second world war, fascism, communism being at that time, the most vibrant systems, they looked like the most likely solution. And then in the aftermath of world war two, you had, all of these people who'd gone through that incredibly traumatic learning experience, building all these all these systems, the World Bank, the UN, um, the all of these systems, which all have their um, flaws as well, but they they kind of what the IMF, I mean, they kind of worked, and they worked like it. We shouldn't take for granted the situation we've had over the last. 70 or 80 years and I think far too many of us are like this is not we can look for all the corruption and all of the holes and all of the things that it was leaving out but for fuck's sake look around you at kind of as Peterson says like look around at what a fucking miracle it is that we don't live in a society like I mean I've, I've lived I've worked around the world in Haiti and um, Africa and like these we are we're in a pretty miraculous situation and I just look for example at like this blue church, um, this blue church entity in foreign affairs, which is the area I know very well. And I look at the way that Trump and other forces are just obliterating all of these structures. And we're going back to great power politics. We're going back to might makes right. We're going back to, um, and might makes right in a world where China is probably going to come out of this crisis as the dominant superpower with everything they're doing. And they are arguably on a par with like some of the stuff they're doing is on a par with some, some of the stuff that Germany was doing in the 1930s and forties. Like, do you realize what that means? Do you realize what the destruction of that system that we've taken for granted actually means in practice? Like, do you realize how much that, like we talk about kind of the, the, the caterpillar and the butterfly, like that liquefaction process, it's fucking, it's going to be fucking terrifying. And like, do you, do you know what that, like everyone I think who I've worked with, like who kind of understands the way the world works from a kind of institutions perspective is just like, oh my fucking God, we are, and who knows what it's going to be. It's going to be, I mean, nothing's off the table. I mean, warfare, including nuclear war is on the table. Um, massive societal uprooting like we've got no idea what the society on the other side of this is going to look like and there's so many different ways it could go so that's what i mean by like i think this this is one thing i'd like to have a conversation with jordan hall about even from a sense making perspective like if we lose the institutions of the blue church we lose the institutional memory of those like newsrooms of making sense of the world like without anything meaningful to, to on the other side of that that's a I, i'm i'm up for that as a kind of thought experiment and i'm up for it as a like okay let's take the plunge and i but it's like we don't know what the world on the other side of it's going to look like i have faith that something will come to break our fall but we really are jumping off a cliff and i don't yeah i i think it can, very, it can very easily feel quite naive to say, oh, well, yeah, the blue church is dying. And then we've got this kind of insurgency or this network solution on the other side. It's like, I'm not seeing that network solution and things seem to be falling apart very, very quickly. We're not going to be caught by anything in the near term. So that, that's, does that answer your, your question? Yeah. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Sorry. I don't I'm mean serious, to get but, to, no, it's um, okay. It's okay. I, I do the, the naive, waiting for the thing to crash a lot and I, do, I tend to like bias my thinking away from what you were talking about so thanks a lot i think i like i i'm i am genuinely an optimist i think we'll be 
okay. But I think unless you really face up to what what that means, like what I, I think we're we're just in so much danger of magical thinking. And I see so much magical thinking in this space. Like, can you face that full can you can you look that full in the face? Can you look what that is likely to mean full in the face and still keep the the positivity and the optimism on the other side. Um, so Jamie Wheel did an amazing talk, um, which is on our, our site. I'll maybe ask Peter to send it out afterwards. Called it was a it was a workshop we did called um, what was it? Sense making in an age of existential risk. Collective sense making in an age of existential risk, where he just laid all of that out beautifully. And at the time when he gave it, this was last year, I thought, wow, Jamie's gone off the deep end. He's way, way more apocalyptic than I've ever heard him. I don't know if I agree with him. Now I kind of think, oh, yeah, he was he was ahead of the curve. He. And, and that's the other thing is I've kind of felt in this exploration, like I've held these two pieces of like Jordan Peterson, Steven Pinker of nowhere in the best time to ever be alive. Things are getting better and better. And and also speaking to a lot of people who were talking about existential risk and were really kind of laying out a very different picture. And it's like, can I hold both of these? And I feel like I did in the inquiry on the channel, but as soon as the pandemic hit and it was just like, okay, systematic cascade looks pretty obvious to me now. Okay, now I'm, now I'm collapsing into, I, I, think, I think the ideas space of these possibilities has collapsed quite radically in the last few months. And on one of our Zoom calls the other day with someone who was one of our one of our members, she's in a Jordan Peterson uh, discussion group, and she said, "Oh yeah, I, I talked to them about Rebel Wisdom, and they say, oh, what they, they're so they, they're always saying how how they're so left wing, and they're always saying how the world's like really going to hell, and it's like, guys, have you, have you looked outside recently? I mean, existential risk and systematic cascade, like that's not." It, 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 surely that's not a fringe position now like for a long time it was and I was actually I, I never went down that rabbit hole as much as say I think Peter's went down it a lot more and I know our mutual friend Daniel Thorson did a lot on his podcast and felt that he was kind of following this thread of kind of existential risk and I was quite resistant to that I didn't go down that far but but now I'm like yeah that's I'm seeing it all play out. Like Daniel Schmachtenberger talks about ex exponential tech on a finite playing field is self-terminating. And that's what I'm seeing mostly in the kind of, my focus is mostly on the information ecology because I think that's, that's the, the source of a lot of what we're seeing. But it feels to me like weaponized information, weaponized disinformation, like the pandemic film being a perfect example of like something that's incredibly sticky, it's incredibly compelling, but it's playing the game a self-destructive game. It's it's like it's limbic hijack. It's highly emotive language, whether or not it's true. Try and and I'm trying. That's, as I said before, I'm trying to take out the whether or not these narratives are true, and just look at what's happening to us from a from a kind of meta perspective. So it's a bit of a rant, but well, cool. thanks a lot. Uh, I'll, I'd love to ask more, but I'll let you go. So we have, uh, um, yeah, we should close out soon. We have five minutes, uh, but I'll just maybe hand it back to you, David. Is there anything you want? You, like, I'm curious where you, where Rebel Wisdom is going, uh, content wise. And I'm curious so am I. This, 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 uh, this next video, you want to tease us a little bit or, or no? Um, well, it's about conspiracies again. Mm. I'm trying to look at the, the, um, it's a piece about spirituality and conspiracy. Right. Is this a new phenomenon that we're seeing kind of post David Icke or, or sorry, post, I think we're seeing a new phenomenon. I think we're seeing like, we, we all knew what the info wars, Alex Jones thing was. I think we're seeing something new and it's sort of, it's love consciousness awakening. And at the same time, this evil cult is out to kill us all. And I think that's a new phenomenon. So I'm trying to do a film about that. And people are not going to like it. <laughs> but, it's, but it's what I'm honestly seeing and what I'm trying to... And I'm also bringing in the, the, the concept of 
spiritual, spiritual, like genuine spiritual awakening in that, because I think people have a taste of questioning the mainstream narrative and then we can easily fall into over what's the word like making sense too quickly on the other side of that mm. and that's what i'm trying to convey with that film it's like using the, the concept of spiritual emergency the concept of um genuine awakening how can we hold an, an open frame and i don't want to kind of dismiss all of the conspiracy narratives because i'm yeah i believe some of them are are true there, there's um but it's it's a secular religion and people are as touchy about it as people would be if you go into a christian convention and start criticizing christianity so right, right. and that in my, that to it that in itself is a fascinating phenomenon can we talk about how it's how it attracts levels of certainty that are religious in nature without triggering people no you can't do it without triggering people you will trigger people so maybe maybe i close down the comments i don't know See but that's going to Drunk upset club. people even more yeah I, I would love to see like you know uh hardcore people who are into the parapolitical space or conspiracy theory space and people from the blue church that criticize it i would love to have to see a conversation somehow between between those uh uh two people or representatives of it um and so the rebel wisdom festival is coming next weekend as well yes uh, yes so you can i'm speaking at it or i'm doing something there uh, i think dialogue was with john mcbake or whatever so you can check out the that link I think people can still sign up uh, or is that yes it? yeah you can yeah. still sign up so yeah. Ali so we've done two really really good events we did two one day events as a kind of trial for it and Ali has been working really hard on the Rebel Wisdom Festival and wants it to be the best online event that's ever existed so cool um, and some pe people said that the, the first one day ones that we did was were some of the best one day events they'd, they'd been to so um, Let's see. Cool. Awesome. Yeah, looking forward to for it and seeing everyone there. Uh, David, thanks so much, my friend, for coming on to the Stoa today. Uh, it was a lovely chat. Thank you. Um, yeah, so for everyone else, uh, upcoming events, uh, we have the Side View launch party tomorrow with Adam Robert at 6.30 uh, p.m. Eastern time. Uh, the third uh, version of the Side View is coming up. I have a medic mediation piece there. We're going to have like a party. Benita Roy is coming. All these interesting people are coming. Joshua Fields, our buddy David Joshua Fields, is coming in on Thursday, 2.30 p.m. Eastern Time on Trauma, Truth, and Technology. And then we have a relational exegesis event uh, where we're going to read a text together. Uh, Keith Johnson's Impro, uh, or Improv, or whatever it's called, at 4 p.m. Eastern Time. That's on Thursday as well. All right, everyone. Thanks so much for coming out today. Greatly appreciate it. Take care.